Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by, and welcome to Northern Technologies International Corporation's first quarter 2020 earnings conference call and webcast. At this time, all participant lines are in listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star 0. As part of the discussion today, the representatives from NTIC will be making certain forward-looking statements regarding NTIC's future financial and operating results, as well as their business plans, objectives, and expectations. Please be advised that these forward-looking statements are covered under the safe harbor provisions of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995, and that NTIC desires to avail itself of the protections of the safe harbor for these statements. Please also be advised that actual results could differ materially from those stated or implied by the forward-looking statements due to certain risks and uncertainties, including those described in NTIC's most recent annual report on Form 10-K, subsequent quarterly reports on Form 10-Q, and recent press releases. Please read these reports and other future filings that NTIC will make with the SEC. NTIC disclaims any duty to update or revise its forward-looking statements. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Patrick Lynch, President and CEO. Thank you. Please go ahead, sir. Good morning. I'm Patrick Lynch, NTIC's CEO, and I'm here with Matt Wolsfeld, NTIC's CFO. Please note that the financial results for our fiscal 2020 first quarter were included in a press release issued earlier this morning, a copy of which is available at NTIC.com. During this call, we will review various key aspects of our fiscal 2020 first quarter, financial results, give a brief business update, comment on our net sales and earnings guidance for the remainder of fiscal 2020, and then conclude with a question and answer session. Our fiscal 2020 first quarter net sales set a new first quarter record, in part due to a rebound in zeroist industrial sales over the past three months, primarily caused by stabilizing demand in both North America and China. During the same period, however, demand across the majority of our other global industrial markets remained weak, causing sales by our JVs to decline by 16% and negatively impacting first quarter profitability. Nevertheless, despite current short-term macroeconomic conditions brought on by various international trade disputes, we believe we are well positioned to grow our global market share as a result of our expansive geographic footprint, strong operating joint ventures, and global corrosion prevention expertise, as we believe fiscal 2020 will be another good year of profitable growth for NTIC. So with these highlights, let's examine the drivers for the first quarter. For the first quarter ended November 30th, 2019, total consolidated net sales increased 3.8% to $14.6 million as compared to the first quarter ended November 30th, 2018. Broken down by business unit, this included a 16.2% increase <clears throat> in NatureTech net sales and a 4.6% increase in zeroist industrial net sales, offset by a 9.6% decrease in net sales from NTIC to its zeroist joint ventures and a 47.2% decrease in zeroist oil and gas net sales. Total net sales by our joint ventures, which we do not consolidate in our financial statements, were $25.5 million for the, first, for, for, for the fiscal 2020 first quarter, compared to $30.5 million for the same period last fiscal year. This 16% decline in joint venture net sales was the result of softer worldwide demand across many of the industrial markets we serve. Net sales by our wholly owned NTIC China subsidiary were $3.9 million for the fiscal 2020 first quarter compared to $3.2 million for the same period last fiscal year. The 21.9% increase at NTIC China during the first quarter of fiscal 2020 
was a result of both higher zeros industrial and nature tech sales. We remain optimistic about the long-term potential in China as we intend to further expand our presence within this large and growing market. Zerost oil and gas sales remain volatile primarily due to long sales cycles, overall challenging marketing con- market conditions, and the timing of orders and deliveries. Net sales for the first quarter were down 47% compared to last fiscal year. As we stated on our last conference call, there are several projects that we have been waiting to close. I am pleased to announce that we are currently delivering product for these projects and as a result expect to see a significant increase in oil and gas revenue in the second quarter and expect first half oil and gas revenues to be higher than the 1.3 million dollars of oil and gas revenue we recorded during the fiscal 2019 first half we remain committed to the oil and gas market and believe we will be successful over time as more oil and gas customers adopt our solutions to replace cathodic and coating corrosion protection Now, turning to our NatureTech bioplastics business. For the fiscal 2020 first quarter, NatureTech net sales increased 16.2% to a first quarter record of 4.7 million dollars. NatureTech continues to achieve significant growth rates and as a result of strong demand in North America through our domestic distribution network, as well as higher demand as well as higher sales of finished products and resin compounds by NTIC's majority owned subsidiary in India and NTIC's wholly owned subsidiary in China the use of conventional polyethylene and polypropylene plastics continues to face ever increasing societal and political criticism due to environmental and waste disposal concerns This is reflected in the increasing global interest we are experiencing for NatureTech's bio-based and compostable product solutions. So, while global market demand for zero sales remains soft in the short term, our business continues to benefit from the geographic market and product diversification strategies we are pursuing. We believe we are well positioned to expand profitability this fiscal year as a result of continued growth at NTIC China and NatureCheck as well as improving demand for zerost oil and gas products and solutions. With this overview, let me now turn the call over to Matt Wolfsfeld to summarize our financial results for the fiscal 2020 first quarter. Thanks Patrick. NTIC's net sales increased 3.8% in the fiscal 2000 uh 20 first quarter as a result of the trends Patrick reviewed in his prepared remarks lower sales across many of our global joint ventures impacted joint venture operating income which decreased 22.7% for the fiscal 2020 first quarter compared to the prior fiscal year we continue to proactively manage expenses and our total operating expenses decreased 4.5% or by $280,000 to $5.9 million dollars during the fiscal 2020 first quarter primarily due to a $446,000 reduction in G&A costs as a result of prudent cost control measures taken in the United States, India and China during the fiscal 2020 first quarter. We continue to invest in developing new VCI solutions as well as bioplastic products and during fiscal 2020 first quarter NTIC invested nearly $1 million in R&D activities compared to nearly $900,000 in the first quarter of last fiscal year. NTIC reported net income of $1.2 million or 13 cents per diluted share for the fiscal 2020 first quarter compared to $1.5 million or 16 cents per diluted share for the fiscal 2019 first quarter. I'm also pleased with the improvement in net income over the past 3 months as compared to earn, as compared as the company earned $829,000 or 9 cents per diluted share for the fiscal 2019 fourth quarter. As of November 30th, 2019, working capital was $25.3 million, including $4.1 million in cash and cash equivalents and $3 million in available for sale securities, compared to nearly $25.5 million, including $5.9 million in cash and cash equivalents and $3.6 million in available for sale securities as of August 31st, 2019. NTIC's business model does not require significant additional capital 
and we expect our financial model will continue to produce strong operating cash flows. As we've experienced in prior years, our cash balance is typically at its lowest level in November. We expect our cash balance will increase as our fiscal year progresses as a result of the seasonal benefits we typically experience in earnings from operating activities and anticipated continued business growth and improvement in profitability. On November 30th, 2019, the company had $25.4 million in investment of joint ventures, of which approximately 56%, or $14.2 million, is in cash, with the remaining balance invested in working capital. During the fiscal 2020 first quarter, NTIC's board of directors declared a cash dividend of six cents per common share that was payable on November 20th, 2019 to shareholders of record on November 6th, 2019. The first quarter dividend increased 8.3% over the first quarter dividend payment last fiscal year, which reflects our belief in the continued strength in our future financial performance. Now turning to NTIC's annual guidance for the fiscal year ending August 31st, 2020, we continue to expect fiscal 2020 sales to be between 62 and $66 million. We estimate our net income attributable to NTIC will continue to range between $5.6 and $7.5 million, or between 60 and $0.80 cents per diluted share for fiscal 2020. These estimates are subject to significant risks and uncertainties, including those described in our forward-looking statements, disclosure, and our earnings release. As you can see, despite the macro-level slowdown we've recently experienced across our joint ventures, we remain well-capitalized and well-positioned to execute our long-term growth opportunities. As a result, we remain excited about the direction that we're headed. With this, Patrick and I are happy to take your questions. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from Tim Clarkson with Van Clemens. Your line is open. Hi, guys. Uh, good quarter. Um, just wanted to see if there's any uh, uh, new color in terms of your compostable business, in terms of where you're seeing uh, uh, the best opportunities. Um, yeah, I, I, thanks for the question, Tim. The, uh, for, from a nature tech standpoint, we're still continuing to see the significant demand growth kind of on the same um, you know, with, with obviously the same business lines and with similar opportunities that we've talked about over the past, uh, over the past couple of years. The, you know, there's obviously still uh, a growing demand for this product across North America. We're seeing significant growth for the product in, uh, in Asia, specifically what we're selling through our, uh, our Chinese subsidiary and, uh, and still in India. So, you know, across the garment space, across the, um, you know, just the, the, the traditional uh, compostable business as far, as far as supplying, you know, the, the, the bag liners and uh, cutlery and things like that, it's uh, where we're seeing the growth. Um, we're, we're, starting to deliver, we're starting to also deliver, uh, you know, larger quantities of resin to customers so they can produce uh, their own products with the base resins that we are, uh, you know, that we're providing to them. So that's, you know, one of the things that we think is an exciting opportunity for us is to provide larger quantities of resins to these, uh, to these companies. So, you know, we still anticipate kind of those three product lines being the main, uh, you know, product lines that will kind of push us through the next, uh, you know, probably the next year, year plus. Uh huh. Now I've been told that the, the you know, one of the big uh, pluses that your compostable products have is superior strength and while it's, the products are compostable. Uh, you know they have similar strain characteristics to conventional plastic. And uh, how does the, how how does that play out when you're competing with uh, competitive compostable products? Um, very well for us. Uh, I think our customers are very pleased with the product performance and also the cost points we can reach. But I mean we're, we're talking not just stronger mechanical performance, but also providing it at, at a lower cost to what our competitors are able to offer. Okay. Now, now what's what's been uh, dr driving the the China the China growth? Uh, primarily the garment industry. It's an expansion of what we were doing in uh, in India and other parts of Southeast Asia. Right. Right. And uh, you know you've been spending a lot of money on R, R and D. Is there anything that you can talk about in terms of? potential new products that could be significant? Uh, nothing that I'm that I can share with you uh, on this call today. Okay. All right, I'm done. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. 
Thank you. Our next question comes from Jerry Well with Private Investor. You may begin. Morning, guys. See, um, just curious on the JV side, um, where uh, are you seeing the decrease primarily? Is it, uh, if you could give us a little more color as far as industry, is it tied to automotive or whatever, what's driving down uh, the sure. revenue side, uh, and, and, and by country? Sure. Um, uh, we are seeing a, a – there's still a, an ongoing slowdown in the uh, automotive industry in China. Uh, we're growing our sales in China primarily by selling Xeros products into other market segments. But uh, India, for example, is way off uh, because the Indian automotive component supply base is really uh, hit the skids in the last couple of uh, – last six months to nine months. And uh, there's even an article that was published today by, uh, by excuse me, on January 3rd by in Bloomberg, says uh, Germany's humbled industrial titan set for tough 2020, according to E&Y. Um, there are so even in Europe, a lot of the automotive companies like Daimler, uh, BMW, uh, Volkswagen, uh, Renault are seeing a decrease uh, in demand, uh, in in partly. Uh, due to the ongoing trade tensions that we've been seeing around the world, so that's the so it's 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 pretty much spread out across the globe, on, across the automotive industry at this point. Okay, and then one of the last question I'm wondering uh, relating to has been resistance uh, on the oil and gas side to make the expenditure right, and uh, we've been talking about it for a number of years. Have you seen any significant change in uh, the way companies are looking at that investment on the oil and gas uh, on the protection side? Um, it is gaining. Uh, we, are, we are gaining greater acceptance and, and recognition because uh, we've been presenting, along with customers, successful case studies at industry conferences like NACE, for example. Um, so it's getting easier to uh, introduce this in new locations, uh, and we've been doing a number of new installations in Africa this year and parts of the Middle East that we haven't been in before. Um, and so uh, it, we are getting broader acceptance. Uh, the, the, the market conditions in oil and gas in general have been a little bit challenging over the last uh, 12 months with fluctuating oil prices. Um, and uh, so we're just uh, trying to combat that while the projects are go going forward. It's just taking some time, and occasionally they will get pushed from one quarter to the next as they're making adjustments to their budgets based on uh, cash availability. Okay. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks for your hard work and dedication. Sure. I'm Thanks. done. Thank you. Our next question. Question comes from Scott Bilodeau with Walrus Partners. Your line is open. Oh, hi guys! Thanks for taking my question. Uh, I, I got I got just a couple questions here. Uh, on uh, oil and gas, you mentioned that uh, you are now delivering, so you do see a pretty significant uh, uh, pickup and good visibility. Is that you know just for this quarter? Is there is there longer term visibility to that? Maybe if you could just kind of give us a, a little view there. Sure. No, what we're seeing today as far as product that we expect to be out the door, let's say by January 15th, is that we're already at a point now where, you know, sales for, you know, for, for this fiscal year through January um, are already at a point that are the same as what we were at through the full first six months of the year last year. Um, obviously, last year we had a really uh, poor Q2 from an oil and gas standpoint, um, but we, we had a much stronger December and a very strong January from a sales standpoint in, in oil and gas. So um, I, I don't have, although it looks like from a, an oil and gas standpoint in the first quarter, we're down, you know, 50 percent, almost 50 percent. Um, I, I don't have a lot of concerns about uh, eclipsing, you know, where we were last year through the six month uh, through the six month period. As far as the expectations for the remainder of the year, the, the, the pipeline of projects that we have right now that we expect to close on during the next eight, nine months of the year, um, you know, it, it's significantly more business that we, than what we had at, at the same time last year. 
Um, so there are more projects out there. There's more projects that we expect to close. We expect at this point in time are that our oil and gas revenue for the year will be higher than what the oil and gas revenue was last year. Um, whether that's going to be, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars more or, uh, you know, a couple million dollars more, that's what we will, uh, that's what we'll see. But there are significant projects out there that, um, as they're closed, will have a dramatic impact from both a revenue standpoint and, and an earnings standpoint, you know, given the margins that we see in oil and gas. Great. Thanks. And then anything new on the pipeline side of that? I know uh, it's been working, and those are, you know, long styles, probably lots of, uh, you know, I don't know if there's a test phase that has to, you know, or, or a proving out phase for there. I, I, anything anything new you can comment on there on the, on the pipeline protection side? I, I wouldn't say specifically anything new. There are various opportunities that we're looking at as far as, uh, as, far as pipeline protection. Um, you know, those, those are coming along. There's nothing... There's no projects that we have at this point in time that's the size of what we did, you know, in fourth quarter of 2018. We were talking about, uh, you know, protecting several thousand kilometers of, uh, of pipe. We don't have um, pr any projects that are on hold that are of that size, um, but there certainly are other pipeline proposals uh, and projects that we're looking at that are on a smaller scale. Um, you know, we think the technology and what we have as far as, you know, specifically dealing with the pipeline solution is, is a good one. But it takes, uh, you know, it's taking it takes some time to close on those deals and to uh, you know become more of a standard. Great, thanks. And then one last question, just related to Nature Tech. Um, you know, I know you've talked about uh, hopefully you know turning into more delivering resin as opposed to final final product. Uh, maybe you can give us a little sense. Of, are we still really early in that? Because that probably will alter the optics of what that business looks like, because you may see lower revenue, but since it's just resin, it may be higher margin. Is that something that we should see or start to, you know, see that transition at some point uh, during this fiscal year? I wouldn't expect it this fiscal year. Um, as Matt mentioned, okay. we are getting, we, ha we have at least one large customer in the United States that is now buying significant quantities of our resin compounds to produce their own injection molded plastic products. Um, so that, that's probably our big anchor client at this point in that category. Um, okay. And we, we get, we, we, we've got sm certain smaller projects we work on, but uh, for the most, for, at least for this fiscal year, we still foresee most of the sales going, coming from finished products. And, and Scott, even with even with the the resin that we're selling, it, it's not like we're selling a, a concentrate or anything like that. We're still selling a the, the same amount of total pounds of product that would be used to make a very you know a a, pro, a, a product for these uh, for these companies. So you wouldn't have a situation where you know the amount of the amount of revenue is you know significantly lower than uh, if we were selling the, uh, the finished product. And, and margins on the resin are very similar to the margins that we were selling the finished product at. Okay. So, and I'll say with the, with the resin deliveries, you know, the, the, I want to say the first, uh, the, the first couple of resin deliveries just happened in you know, the last month of the first, uh, of the first quarter. Great. Great. Okay. Thanks much uh, for the update. Uh, good quarter. Uh, uh, thanks for the, the answer my questions. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jim Dowling with Jeffries Capital. Your line is open. Yes, uh, good morning. Can we get a, a little bit into the uh, details on Nature Tech in terms of of 100% of their sales, how much is United States versus the rest of the world and with specific emphasis on China and, and India? And if you look at the sources of revenue and you take the first quarter, how is how were the growth rates different or similar among those major consuming areas? Sure. Um, if I break out, uh, if I'm looking at Nature Tech from a um, geographic breakout, the, the growth in Nature Tech North America in first quarter was was about 10 percent. The growth in Nature Tech India was about uh, 23 or 24 percent. And the growth in Nature Tech China was about 20%. So, 
so the you know, and, and we break out the total uh, you know the total revenues uh, in, for for Nature Tech in the uh, in the queue, but you know as I'm as I'm looking at it, um, so I'm looking at you know to, total Nature Tech sales in North America for Q1 are close to let's see one point but. 2.2 uh, about 2.2 million um, total revenue at Nature Tech India is about uh, a little over 2 million and Nature Tech China is it looks like I'm adding these up on the uh, I'm adding up monthly numbers on the fly so it's about 450 thousand okay thank you yep. Thank you. Our next question comes from Joe First with First Associates. Your line is open. Good morning, gentlemen. My questions had to do with oil and gas, and mostly have been answered. Uh, just one question. Uh, the new business you are getting from there, is it coming from uh, new orders from uh, existing customers or from new customers? It's always a combination of both. Okay. Thank you. And good job. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a question at this time, please press star then one or you touched on telephone. Our next question comes from Gus Richard with Northland. Your line is open. Yes, thanks for taking my questions. On the, the Z-Rust business, you had a strong quarter. Um, is that a function of new customer seasonality um, or, or, you know, inventory replenishment? Um, a little, can you add a little color there? I don't know that we've seen a significant, you know, a significant amount of inventory replenishment. It seems like we're kind of still in the we're we're still in the phase, at least what I'm seeing in North America, as far as consistent orders. We haven't seen a a bump yet where you know customers are refilling inventories where you'd kind of see that double, uh, you know, the double jump of existing orders and building up uh, inventory yet. Um, I can't really comment on that for the uh, for, for any of the joint ventures. I don't have the uh, don't have the data. Um, I would say from a Chinese from from a China standpoint, as far as what we're seeing at Zeros China, the majority of the growth that we have seen there is outside of the automotive industry. And so while you know, as Patrick commented, that auto sales are still down throughout Asia and in China, we've been able to um, you know augment that decrease. In, in auto industry with new opportunities outside of the uh, outside of the automotive industry, so the 20 plus percent growth that we're seeing at, at uh, in, in China is due to non automotive sales growth opportunities. Got it. Thanks. And then on the the nature tech side, it, it looks like your year over year comps have been decelerating for a bit now, um, and particularly I think North America. If um, with your new resident customer in, in North America, should those should those North America um, sales start to reaccelerate from here? I, I would expect our Q2, uh, you know, our, our Q2 Nature Tech numbers to be, you know, higher than Q1. It was, it was things were a little bit slower in Q1 than uh, than what we expected, specifically in uh, in North America. Uh, we're, we're targeting certainly a higher growth rate than uh, than ten percent. And like you said, with the additional you know business coming in from just incremental customer growth throughout you know our distribution uh, base to some of the new resin customers, I would expect those numbers to be uh, higher throughout the rest of the uh, the year. Um, you know, as far as growth in in India and in China, a, a 20 plus percent growth rate is uh, I think certainly reasonable for what they're looking at given the growth that they saw last year. Um, you know, out, out of those two, uh, out of those two regions. Got it. And then the last one for me is um, you did a great job um, holding um, G&A down in the quarter. Is that a sustainable trend, or you know, is that a, a one-off for the quarter? Um, I would say a little. I'd say it's a little bit of both. Uh, there certainly are some. Uh, uh, there, there were some items. That we worked on as far as cost control initiatives across the across the company. It's certainly been a goal of the company, as I've kind of explained to each of you when I've met with you individually, that you know the goal is to have very low operating expense growth 
Um, I, I don't expect to have uh, cost decreases that are going to, you know, be sustainable or going forward. Um, you know, there are some things that were, um, you know, as far as people leaving and, you know, other, other things like that, that, that where we will be hiring people coming on, so there will be some additional uh, um, expense growth, but we still have the overall corporate objective of having very low single-digit operating expense growth to be able to leverage the, uh, the top-line revenue growth. And with the expectations of, you know, the concerns that we have right now about what's going on from a macro standpoint with the automotive industry and other industrial uh, industries, certainly keeping a tight control of our, uh, of our costs is something that we are, uh, we're focusing on. Got it. Thanks. That's it for me. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Our next question comes from Thomas Quaggis with Ampla Capital. Your line is open. Yeah, hi. Um, Matt, since you predicted correctly that uh, business will rebound this quarter, um, what's the visibility on the JV side uh, in terms of whether it's bottoming or not? This is probably the lowest quarter in a long time, um, and it you know it changes the profitability significantly for the company. So, is there any visibility on that? Um, there, do, you, do you mind muting your line real quick because you're Somehow there's a lot of feedback. I, I heard your question, and I think I can comment on it, but if you could mute your line, that'd be uh, terrific. Um, I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> I'll just hang up. You can answer the question. All right. All right. Sorry about that. The As far as... You know, visibility into the joint ventures. I, I know Patrick has had conversations with, uh, with numerous joint venture, uh, um, um, partners as far as kind of what we're seeing from a global standpoint. Um, yeah, do you want to? I didn't hear the question. You, you oh, his, the question was basically what visibility does NTIC have into the joint venture performance given that this is the biggest decrease that we've seen in joint venture sales for some time? Ah, well, it's, like I mentioned earlier, it's tied to basically a global macro shutdown or, or slowdown uh, in the autom primarily in the automotive industry um, so far. Uh, but as I also mentioned that, uh, the, for example, the, the key economy in Europe, Germany, is seeing a, a significant slowdown across all their top 100 companies, industrial companies. So um, I, I think that... Uh, um, I, I'd say with, with, with talking to the various partners, one thing I can comment on is we're not seeing, it's not as if there is a, a loss of any one customer or it's not as if there's any kind of a uh, competitor coming in that is taking the, the business or the market share away from us. What we're seeing is that the, the, the sizes of the orders that are being placed, the, the volumes and the inventory levels at our customers are what is, uh, are, are what is coming down. And so, you know, with, with, with fewer orders or smaller orders coming in, um, that's what's having the biggest impact on overall, uh, on overall revenue. Um, you know, the expectations that we have are that, similar to the United States, a lot of the other countries in the world are going to be uh, somewhat behind the, uh, the, the United States. And whether that's going to be three months, six months, you know, 12 months, uh, the company is certainly positioned so that, you know, longer term, when we see the industrial rebound across the world, the company is going to be positioned to, you know, highly leverage that uh, that rebound. So, I, I hope that answered your question. And you hung up. Yeah, hung up. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Our next question is follow up from Scott Belito with Walrus Partners. Your line is open. Oh, um, hi guys. Thanks. Uh, just a uh, uh, thought there just uh, um, uh, as a follow-up to that question. Is there, you know, uh, we, you know, certainly we've seen a macro slowdown, but is there any sense that, uh, you know, within the auto or the industrial businesses uh, out there, that there's just less metal in general that needs to be protected um, on a go-forward basis? Is there taking metal out of things? Yeah, IE, you know, I mean, electric car probably has a less metal than a, than a, uh, you know, than, than an older uh, combustion. You know, any, do you guys have any sense or is there a discussion about that at all? Um, 
That that certainly. Uh, I mean, yes, electric vehicles use uh, fewer com metal components, and uh, I'm, we're, we're watching that trend, but we're we're not seeing a significant shift in that yet. Um, also, um, like I said, we, right now it's a, a it's more of a, a a decrease in general demand by our customers, uh, which they all seem to to relate to temporary uh, slowdowns because of macro issues. Uh, as Matt mentioned, we're not seeing any loss of customers. We're not losing projects. Um, it's just that they're ordering less given what demand levels are at right now. Okay, Th thanks. Yeah, I mean, it, it, certainly we got a macro slowdown, so it's kind of hard to hard to vet whether there's an organic switch in there. So I, I just I just didn't know if you uh, uh, might and, and have as, as I mentioned, as I mentioned, And as I mentioned earlier in the call, for, for example, in China, uh, we're shifting our focus away from the automotive industry because we know that we're not going to get much joy from them in the next 12 months. Uh, so we're, a lot of the business increases you're seeing in China, for example, are coming from other industries other than automotive, where uh, they're using a plenty of metal now and in the future. Great. Uh, thanks. Appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. And I'm currently showing no further questions at this time. I'd like to turn the call back over to Patrick Lynch for closing remarks. I would just like to thank everybody for calling in today uh, and wish you a nice afternoon. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.